Okay, the title of my sermon this morning is The Sabbath Day. So I'm going to teach you in this sermon everything I know about the Sabbath. So hopefully I don't uh, go too long. I'll try and go through it as quick as I can. But there are churches out there that believe that still believe in Sabbath keeping. And now, keeping the Sabbath isn't a sin in and of itself. If somebody wants to keep one day aside for rest, uh, even if it's the Saturday, that's not a sin in and of itself. But there are churches like you know, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They not only believe in Sabbath keeping, but one of the, the main issues with it is they believe in Sabbath keeping to be saved. A lot of them don't believe that, you know, if you, keep the, if you don't keep the Sabbath, then you won't go to heaven. And that's obviously a form of works salvation. They have a lot of emphasis on keeping that Sabbath, and they're even named after that. That's why they call it the Seventh-day Adventist, because, you know, that's uh, one of their main issues. Now, other churches believe and teach that Sunday is the New Testament Sabbath. Now, I don't believe that um, because I believe this is just conjecture. You know, they don't really have any clear verses that teach that Sunday is the new Sabbath, but I understand their reasoning for why they believe it is so. I just don't think it's strong enough to be able to say that everybody must abide by it as, be, as opposed to it being a point of conviction. So the first day of the week is significant. And it is to assume that the disciples believe this was the new Sabbath day, but we don't have any clear scripture showing that it's transition from one to the other. It's, it's similar to a lot of other uh, reformed theology where they just assume that something goes from one thing to the next. Like, for example, a lot of people believe that communion is the, the New Testament Passover, which, is, which I don't believe. Now, there are there some, maybe some similarities and things like that? Well, that's uh, you know, up for debate. But I think that there are, there, they, these are two different ordinances, and it's the same with Reformed theology that some people believe that baptism is a form, you know, is the, the continuation of circumcision, uh, a New Testament circumcision, which is how the one way the Protestant churches will try and, uh, you know, justify uh, infant baptism. Now, I used to attend, attend a church that believed like this, that believed that Sunday was the new Sabbath for Christians. And, uh, you know, oftentimes, you know, in the youth group, we would discuss, you know, what activities were, you know, uh, allowed on Sundays and whatnot. I even remember like when I was in that church, I, I started like a badminton club on, uh, on Sundays as an outreach because I thought, OK, you know, so I got Sundays off because I worked on Saturdays. I was in hospitality. So on Sundays uh, um, at, at night time. People didn't have anything to do, so I thought, okay, I hired out a hall, and I, I set up the badminton course, and then I had like my, my computer, and I had like screens playing like ev creation evolution videos, and I thought, hey, this is something I could do for God, but then the church never sanctioned it, right? Because they thought, well, you shouldn't be playing sport on a Sunday, so even though you're trying to do something for the Lord, hey, it's better to obey than to sacrifice, so therefore, you know, they, they never like sort of supported me in doing that. But it just goes to show that, you know, you kind of think, oh, well, you know, what, what can I learn about the Sabbath and things like that? But like we learned about last week, you know, the things that you believe can have practical implications on your life. <coughs> and it's the same with what you believe about the Sabbath. You know, if somebody believes that the Sabbath is something that's still to be kept in the New Testament, that's going to change uh, what they believe is acceptable on what day as well, you know, whether you believe it's Saturday or Sunday. So let's go through a couple of questions. This sermon is going to be more of a yeah, doctrinal one as well this week. So hopefully you learned something a bit, bit interesting this week that you may not know already. Now, now, what is the Sabbath? Now, the word Sabbath just means to rest from your labor and where it comes from all the way in the beginning. It'd be very familiar to us if you just read through the first couple of chapters in your Bible. You see in Genesis 2 where God finishes the creation and in Genesis 2, uh, we see here, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day <coughs> from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it, he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. So we see this pattern here from the very beginning that, you know, man should work six days and then rest seven days. This would be something wise to do and it's something that we see God doing as well to set that pattern. Now, I was talking with Elizabeth last night and I, I was, and I don't know if you guys know the answer to this question, but I was thinking to myself, um, you know, how, how do they know that this seventh day is the Saturday? You know, do they just have Saturday as the seventh day because traditionally that's just, you know, when did the calendar start? So, you know, I guess the assumption is that, you know, God, you know, fellowshipping with Adam, you know, taught him several things and maybe he knew, hey, this is the first day. Because if you think about it from Adam's point of view, Adam was created on day six. 
So he would have thought that was the first day and then maybe he was counting from that. But it was actually the day after was the seventh day, which he would have rested with God. So you would think, you know, maybe God told Adam, hey, this is, this is actually, you're actually alive the second day. This is the seventh day. And then, you know, every seven days, that's how you would count your weeks. And is that something that has just continued throughout time? Or, or are there civilizations that have come and they've changed the calendar? You know, we use like a Roman calendar or whatnot. So is, is the seventh day, Saturday, which we consider the seventh day, just a seventh day according to that calendar? Or does it all go back all the way to this time? I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but that's a question to ask because when people, they always tell me the seventh day is a Saturday and I've just accepted that as, okay, well, people just know that the seventh day is Saturday. But then I ask, I'm asking myself the question, why do people even know that Saturday is the seventh day as opposed to just something that man has created and just uh, determined it as the seventh day? <laughs> so there is the seventh day sabbath and then as we read through leviticus 23 there isn't only that that sabbath which is the seventh day which is what we will see throughout the bible as we look into it there were also the feasts of the lord so as we read through leviticus 23 i'm not going to go there but as we read through leviticus 23 you can see that the feasts of the lord were also sabbaths as well and this is important because a lot of people get the timing of the resurrection and the timing of Jesus' death wrong because they assume he died on the day prior to the Sabbath, assuming that that is the seventh day Sabbath as opposed to the other Sabbaths that are happening throughout the Bible as well. So in Leviticus 23, we see the, all the different feasts of the Lord and there are certain days within those feasts that are Sabbaths as well. So not only do you have the seventh day Sabbath, you have the various feast days, but also in the Bible, there was this concept in the Old Testament of, a, of the Sabbath year, right? So in Leviticus 25, look here. It says here, And the Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Right? Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather it in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the Lord, a Sabbath for the Lord, thou shalt neither sow thy field, nor prune thy vineyard. That which groweth of its own accord of thy harvest, thou shalt not reap, neither gather the grapes of thy vine undressed. For it is a year of rest unto the land. And the Sabbath of the land shall be meat for you, for thee, and for thy servant, and for thy maid, and for thy hired servant, and for thy stranger that sojourneth with thee. And for thy cattle and for, for the beasts that are in thy land shall all the increase thereof be meat. So notice that there is seventh day Sabbath, there's the feast Sabbath, and then there's also a year of Sabbath. So it's not that that whole year they just didn't do anything, right? But it was that it was to allow the land to rest. So there was probably other work going on, but you can see here specifically for the farmers of the land, right? Where they, they can't prune their vineyard and sow their seed. <coughs> So this is not something that is, uh, you know, sinful in and of itself today. But we can get some wisdom here that, you know, nowadays, if you think, they don't do this when they farm crops. They just like, you know, they pump all this sort of stuff into the ground to keep the land just going year after year, seven days a week. And there's probably some wisdom here where if they allowed the land to rest, then their land would probably be more fruitful as we see God here. It's like, because if you read the rest of Leviticus 25, he answers the Israelites saying, hey, well, if you're worried that you're not going to have enough, you know, because you've not only are you not uh, reaping your field in the Sabbath year, but you can't sow as well. So the next year you might worry that you don't have enough. And he says, hey, but if you keep this Sabbath in this Old Testament, he will bless the sixth year. So you'll have enough until the eighth year, right? You'll have enough for you for another two years. Similar to how they didn't collect manna on the seventh day, and yet they had enough to last them through to the next week so how do you keep the sabbath because a lot of people think well the sabbath was a day of of worship that's what it was about and you know yes people did use this day of rest to focus on the lord but it wasn't that you're know, only one day you're meant to worship the lord because every day your life your, your life you should have a lifestyle of worship right it's not that it's you know people get this idea that you know if if, if for people that believe in sabbath keeping right they they think that, okay, well, a Sunday is the day where I focus on God and I think about God and I'm on my best behavior and, you know, I try and you know, not sin as much as I normally do. And then, ah, you know, after Sunday, I can kind of like breathe a sigh of relief and just get back to normal, right? And just be worldly and do all that, you know, not care about the things of God. 
That's not how God wants us to live. God doesn't want you to just think about him one day of the week. The Bible says everything you do, right? Whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. So it's not that we have one day where we come and worship God. You know, the whole idea of us gathering here together is to have church, right? It's the assembly that we come and we have do and we do worship God on this day, right? But that's not the only day you ought to worship God. We ought to have a lifestyle of worship. So even though, even in the Old Testament on the Sabbath, they would go into the synagogue and that would be a day where they'd hear the Bible read and everything like that because the other days they would be working. That didn't mean that they didn't have God at the forefront of their mind every single day in everything that they did. So what was the Sabbath about? And if you remember, when we went back to Genesis, it was about resting, wasn't it? So the Sabbath was about not doing any servant work, servile work. Exodus 20, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord <coughs> blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So you see that there was a day set aside in order for people not to work, in order to rest and to be refreshed and to recover. You know, I guess both physically and spiritually, right? So that it was a day where they would focus a bit more on the Lord um, as the days were busy. But we see here, it's not only yourself, but also for the people that worked for you, right? So we see here, um, here, thou shalt not do any work, so yourself and nor thy son, so it's your family as well, as well as the people that work for you. Now in Leviticus 23, this is where people, and, and even in the New Testament, when we'll go there uh, in a moment, it was misunderstanding the Sabbath, where they, where they thought, well, you couldn't do anything on the Sabbath, and, and you couldn't even do even the things that they were accusing Jesus of doing on the Sabbath day. But we see in Leviticus 23, what sort of work really is the Sabbath referring to? And it shows that the, the Pharisees in the New Testament were really beginning to teach their own traditions in regards to this principle, because even in the Old Testament, it's quite clear what sort of work shouldn't be done. It's no servile work. It's not that you can't do anything at all on these days. So Leviticus 23, we read through, but verse 7, it says, In the first day you shall have an holy convocation, you shall do no servile work therein. So this is why it's like work where you're actually serving in order to, to make a living, right? But ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days, in the seventh days an holy convocation, ye shall do no servile work therein. So that's how somebody would keep the Sabbath. It's a day where they would not do any servile work. Now in the Old Testament, there was a huge penalty for breaking the Sabbath. So this is one of those laws in the, in the Old Testament where it was very serious, where the penalty for breaking the Sabbath was death. I don't know if you know that. But in Exodus 31, we see here, Ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore, ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Every one that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. So why the Sabbath was a day where, you know, you read through the Old Testament, it was a sign between Israel and God of a covenant that he had made with them. So, you know, we, we chose here, you know, you might think, well, why, is this, why does God have such a harsh penalty for breaking the Sabbath? Now, we shouldn't think that way. We should be thinking, well, God is just, God is holy. If he has the death penalty for breaking the Sabbath in the Old Testament, it must have been something very important for, for some reason. So God obviously thought that this ordinance in the Old Testament, which no longer applies to us today, was important enough to discourage it to the point where if somebody broke it blatantly, that they would be put to death. Verse 15, six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Now there was a situation in the Old Testament when somebody did blatantly break the Sabbath day in Numbers 15. Look at this in verse 32. 
And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. So on the Sabbath day, when they're in the wilderness, this is after they've already given the commandment. And, you know, Moses has already explained this is going to be the penalty if somebody breaks the Sabbath. They find somebody going and gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. Now, why is it, why are you not allowed to gather sticks on the Sabbath day? Because you're not meant to be kindling fires on the Sabbath day. Verse 33. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And they put him in ward because it was not declared what should be done unto him. So they sort of took him into custody, right? Sort of like when you get taken to the police station, you're in ward, you're in custody. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall surely shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones, and he died as the Lord commanded Moses. Now, I don't understand all the reasons why God had it so important, but we see here that if God took it this seriously, this is something that was very important to him, um, and, and likely you know, what it represented and how it distinguished the nation of Israel from other nations that maybe did not keep one day uh, you know, separate in order to rest from their labors. Now, in the New Testament, we see the Sabbath being misunderstood in a lot of instances. So I want to go just to a couple of the um, scenarios where Jesus is accused of breaking the Sabbath. And it's not that obviously, obviously Jesus had no sin, so he was not breaking the Sabbath. And during this time, why do we not keep the Sabbath today, but yet they were keeping the Sabbath in the New Testament? You need to understand that in the New Testament, even though, and this is why terminology can make it confusing for people, because even though we refer to the books of the Old Testament and the New Testament, what we're really, refer, what we're really saying is we're, we're referring to books that are written before Jesus came and books after Jesus came, right? Uh, or books that were written after Jesus' resurrection, even though those books that are written after Jesus' resurrection refer to events prior to his resurrection, which is what the Gospels are. So not only do we think of Old Testament, New Testament in terms of the separation of books, we also think of Old Testament, New Testament in terms of time periods as well, right? People say, oh, in Old Testament times, in New Testament times. But the words Old Testament and New Testament actually refer to the covenants. So uh, the Old Testament, which is the Old Covenant, is the, if you keep my commandments, I'll bless you. If you don't keep my commandments, I'll curse you. Now what's confusing is, in the Old Testament times, in the Old Testament books, right? And even in the New Testament books, in the Old Testament time, right? You have the New Testament covenant being alluded to during those times. So this is why you see Jesus teaching on the New Testament, even though he's living in the Old Testament time, in a New Testament book. And sometimes you even see in the Old Testament, you see David preaching on the mercy and the grace of God and God's salvation in an Old Testament time, in an Old Testament book, but it's the New Testament, right? It's the New Covenant. So, I don't know if I just totally lost you there, but, you know, Old Testament, New Testament, you just have to realize people use these phrases, these terms in different ways, and sometimes it, can, it confuses people because I would talk to somebody and I'll say, hey, it's a New Testament book, but I'll say, no, but Jesus is living in an Old Testament time and He's yeah. like alluding to the Old Testament, even though it's in the New Testament book, because he's still living in the Old Testament time period, because he had not yet died and risen again. So this is why they're keeping the Sabbath there, as opposed to we don't keep it now, and I'll explain that a bit later on. So Matthew 12 is the first instance I'll go to in verse 1. It says here, At that time Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples <coughs> were in hunger, and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was in hunger, and they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. So what's Jesus saying here? So they, they, they're walking, they're hungry, and if you know, um, you know, in the Old Testament, you can, you, as you're walking, you can take fruit off of, of somebody's plant, and it's not necessarily stealing. 
Now that doesn't mean, you know, necessarily you should do that because some of you took some fruit off somebody's house. You know, you're going out soul winning and you think like, hey, well, you know, the Bible says, you know, it's all right, take fruit off people's trees. So you're just plucking their fruit and taking it home. Hey, I get that it's not a sin, but you know, it doesn't mean you should do that because they don't know that it's not a sin and that you're allowed to do that. So just keep that in mind, guys. I understand that it's not a sin to take fruit off people's trees, but people may not appreciate that. And I don't necessarily want people, our church to get a bad testimony because we're going out soul winning and we're like, they think we're stealing their fruit. And so, so we understand that it's not stealing, but they may think it's stealing because they don't abide by these principles, right? So just keep that in mind. But that's what they're doing, right? So they're plucking the corn, now, why are the Pharisees getting upset at them? Because they got their idea that, well, you know, because you're not meant to work, you're not meant to pick up sticks, you're not meant to kindle fires, you're not meant to do these things, that you're not even allowed, you know, people that are hungry, you know, the poor and the needy along the way to pluck something for themselves to eat, you know, as they're traveling or as they're, as they're doing their work. So he corrects them, right? And he says, hey, didn't you know and if you didn't know this story, in the Old Testament, you know, David is fleeing Saul and he goes to Abiathar the priest and, and his, him and his men are hungry. And Abiathar doesn't have any food except the food <coughs> that is the showbread. So this is that, that's, you know, within the tabernacle, it's representative of spiritual things and only the priests are meant to eat from that table within the tabernacle and this showbread. But Abiathar gives David and his men this bread to eat and is not condemned for it. And Jesus explains here that, you know, why, why you know, he's, he's, he's responding to the Pharisees to say, well, if, you're, if you think we're doing wrong by plucking these ears of corn, have you not seen that David ate something that was sacred to the priests and yet they, he was blameless? And then he goes on another example when it, when it talks about the priesthood. Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath? And are blameless. Now, obviously, he is, you know, speaking in a way where he's like being sarcastic to them, right? Where he's saying, hey, look, look at what they're doing in the temple. They're breaking what you think is profanity, right? In, in the Sabbath. Now, why? What is he referring to here? Because in the Old Testament, you're not meant to, on the Sabbath, you're not meant to kindle fires. But then fires are happening all the time, right? You have the morning and evening sacrifice within the tabernacle as well. So within the tabernacle, within the temple, he say, hey, they're how, why are they able to profane the Sabbath by kindling these fires? Verse 6, But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless. So what is he explaining here? That there were ordinances in the Old Testament that they had to abide by, but it didn't negate the greater principles that existed within God's law, which is judgment, justice, mercy, love, these things um, like the Bible talks about. So this is what he is trying to explain to the <coughs> Pharisees here. So in verse, uh, in Exodus 35, we see here uh, where it talks about not kindling a fire on the Sabbath. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be to you an holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord, Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. He shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. So one lesson Jesus is trying to expose here to the Pharisees is that they are you know, not having mercy over sacrifice, right? They, it's like uh, you know, when uh, uh, Samuel you know, was talking to Saul and said, hey, it's better to obey than to sacrifice. So even though God has ordinances about sacrifice, about giving, that does not negate the greater principles of love and mercy and things like that, which is what Jesus is trying to teach them. And they are actually misunderstanding. Hey, how do you keep the Sabbath? Because the Sabbath does not negate these things. And therefore, there are scenarios where the Sabbath doesn't need to be kept because, you know, mercy would overrule that. So here, <coughs> one example is like a, what people may call a work of you know necessity like you need to eat and if a poor person needs to eat and needs to pluck things off the tree to eat they are allowed to do that now here's another scenario a bit further down in the chapter in Matthew 12 and says and behold there was a man which had his hand withered and they asked him saying is it lawful to heal 
<coughs> on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him. So you see here that the Pharisees even thought they were so, you know, unmerciful that even if somebody needed help or needed grace on the Sabbath day, they didn't want people to be healed. And he says, he said unto them, what man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? So say that to the, the, to the left-wing people these days that want to just make animals have equal rights with humans. And, you know, if you kill an animal, it's like killing a human. You know, you know eating an animal is like murder. You wouldn't say it's murder with a human. You, know, you wouldn't murder a human, but you murder animals. But here Jesus, you know, the God of the universe, is saying here, hey, a man is better than a sheep. But what he is trying to reveal to the Pharisees here is, he's saying, how can you love your animals even more than you love human beings you know you're at least merciful to your animal there are other situations which i won't go to in this sermon where he says hey if your ox needs a drink will you not let it loose and go and water it on the sabbath day and he says but you get mad at me because i've made a man every whit whole on the sabbath day referring to the man that uh, that was impotent in front of the pool and that he said rise up and carry your bed so the sad thing here is this is what the Pharisees were doing. The Pharisees were being hypocritical. Not only were they not, you know, adhering to the Sabbath day, or not making people adhere to the Sabbath day as God had intended it, but it showed that they even themselves were breaking what, you know, their own laws because they would water their animals and take care of their animals, showing that they cared about their animals more than they cared about the people of God. Says here, then saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. So how evil were these people that to, to see, you know, somebody get healed, and yet they were so fixated on keeping their own traditions of how they understood the commandments that they wanted to condemn Jesus to death. Right? And I guess they get that, you know, from the Old Testament, right? Because the Old Testament, if you broke the Sabbath, it was, it was worthy of the death sentence. But they misunderstood the laws. They did not understand mercy, like he said in, in the beginning of Matthew 12. Now look here at another angle at this same story in Mark 3. It says here, And he saith unto the, unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he said unto them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. Peace. So this is why we say, hey, you don't negate love and mercy by keeping God's laws because what he's saying here is if you kept the Sabbath day by not helping somebody, then are you saying that it's right to do evil on the Sabbath day? Because right? the right thing to do would be to help somebody if you can. If you don't, like if somebody needs food and you say, well, it's the Sabbath day, I can't go and get you food. Well, then he's saying, well, is it okay? Are you then justifying somebody doing evil on the Sabbath day? So how can it be all right to do evil on the Sabbath day, but not okay to do good on the Sabbath day? That's what I take from his question there. And look at verse 5. And when he had looked round about them with anger being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. He saith unto the man, stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored whole as the other. So Jesus, when he heals this man's withered hand, I just think it's interesting here that their response to what he's doing, he's so angry with it, he actually looks at them all with anger and then does it. <laughs> it reminds, I, I took this, this other passage out of my sermon but because it was getting a bit long. But you know, when, when he's with the Pharisees in the house, I remember he... Uh, I think it's in uh, uh, Luke 14, I think it was, where Jesus tends to do that. He tends to see their reaction and then does something. Because in the Pharisees, he says to the Pharisee, like, hey, if I heal this person, don't you do the same? You'd, you'd help your oxen on the same side. He doesn't say anything and then he like, heals him. It's like I'm trying to see what their reaction is. So here, we see here that this reaction makes Jesus very angry. And it reminds me of that verse, you know, be ye angry and sin not. So it is possible for people to be angry and not sin, like the Lord Jesus Christ here was angry, and rightly so. 
He was angry at the fact that they were so heartless to, to be angry at somebody being helped on the Sabbath day when you know, they're doing it to their own animals. Now let's look at one other scenario. So we see mercy over sacrifice in the first example. We see, hey, if you don't do good, then you could be doing evil on the Sabbath day. Uh, in that second example. But here, we see here that sometimes there is a necessity to keep a commandment of God, you know, do something spiritual, and therefore you must do it on the Sabbath. John 7, Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me? because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day. Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So that's interesting that, that Jesus is saying, hey, you don't judge just the way things seem. You have to understand the underlying principles to judge righteously. And yes, it's not a sin to judge, because you know, a lot of people say, doesn't the Bible say, judge not? What's well, judge not lest ye be judged. So it's, it's about condemning hypocritical judgment. But here Jesus is telling us here that you ought to judge not according to the appearance, but you judge righteous judgment. So what was the issue here? Well, Jesus is revealing to them that they have the wrong priorities, like we talked about. You don't, have, you don't negate mercy, justice, and judgment <clears throat> to keep the ordinance of God. It doesn't work that way. God's ordinances always take these things into account. And Jesus condemns this in Matthew 23, when he, when he condemns the scribes and the Pharisees here. He says, Woe unto you! scribes and pharisees hypocrites for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted look at this the weightier matters of the law so you see there are things in the law that override other things in the law because they are weightier they are more important and those smaller the lesser laws must be obeyed in light of the greater laws right so here as well what is he saying here the omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other under. Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. So it's the same principle of, you know, trying to you know, have the mech spokes from the moat in your brother's eye, but you have the beam in your own eye. It's like you try so hard to keep these smaller laws and yet, you're not keeping even the greater law, which is justice, mercy, judgment. Because what were they doing here, if you didn't understand? He's saying you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. Because you remember the tithe was they brought a tenth of their increase of their land into the temple. Now, if you have you know, sheep, it's obvious, because you, know, you could say like, okay, well, I've got ten sheep, so I take, take one. But what they're doing here is like, if you think about herbs, you know, herbs, you know, you'll grow like just a little amount. So maybe they'll say like, okay, tithe of mint. Okay, I've got 10 leaves. I'm going to tithe like one leaf, you know, or whatever. So they, they, they made sure they counted these small things. If you think like anise, it's like a herb, cumin. So they, they made sure these things were all perfect, even though they omitted the things that were more important. All right, let's go on to... So we talked a bit about the Sabbath, what the Sabbath is about, the right way to understand it, the actual law of the Sabbath in the Old Testament, right? Now, why don't we keep <coughs> the Sabbath in the New Testament or any of the Sabbaths in the New Testament? Well, the key verse is in Colossians 2, where we're really given the verse to say, hey, the, the Sabbaths are something that were a shadow. They were a temporary ordinance that were done away with. Colossians 2 verse 13. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, have he quickened together with him, having forgiven you of all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Now think about it. What this verse is saying here, when Jesus died and rose again, there were certain ordinances that were done away with. And he names a few of them here. You know, the meats, the, you know, the drinks, 
and meat and drink. So these are the feasts in respect of a holy day. You know, we'd call these holidays of the new moon or of the Sabbath day. So these are the feasts that are mentioned here as well as the Sabbaths. Now, if the Sabbath still applied in the New Testament, how can the Bible say, let no man judge you, therefore? Because the man could judge you, therefore. Because if, if, if somebody like murders somebody, if somebody steals, then you can say, you did wrong. You can judge somebody and say, you are sinning. But if you were sinning in not keeping the Sabbath, the Bible could not say, let no man, therefore, judge you in respect of a meat and drink in respect of a holiday, right? So it's quite obvious here that keeping the Sabbath is no longer a sin, even though we may garner some principles from it. And I'll go over those in a moment. So keeping the Sabbath is not something we do in the New Testament because we have a clear scripture showing that it is you know, part of these temporary ordinances that was imposed on Israel in the Old Testament. Now, the way a Sabbath keeper may try and get around this, they might try and say, well, you know, you have the feast Sabbath and then you have the seventh day Sabbath, right? So they'll say, well, what this is getting rid of is the seventh day, the, the feasts only and not the seventh day Sabbath. We're still expected to keep the seventh day Sabbath. Now, what they'll say here is, well, that's what that word Sabbaths is referring to. Now, if that is referring to the feasts, then I guess the question is, well, what are the holy days? Because it's saying there's obviously three types here, right? There's the holy days, the new moons, and then the Sabbaths. So if they're saying these Sabbaths are not the seventh day Sabbaths, they're the Sabbaths that are the feasts, then, then what are the holy days? Does that make sense? So it's got it's to fit somewhere. So then, and then you say, why isn't the seventh day Sabbath a holy day? Because if you look at all the verses that we've gone through, this is Exodus 35. Six days shall be worked on, and on the seventh day there shall be to you an holy day. Right? So, so the seventh day, according to God, is a holy day. Right? Isaiah 58. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day. So if they say, you get what I'm saying? So if in Colossians 2, if the Sabbath is referring to the feast, then you could easily say, well, the holy days is referring to the seventh day Sabbath because the seventh day Sabbath is a holy day as well. And remember Exodus 20, remember the seventh day to keep it holy. So the Sabbaths are holy days as well. So what, what I think Colossians 2 is referring to, right, is that the holy days is talking about the, the special days and then the Sabbath is referring to the seventh day Sabbath. But even if they were to try and turn it around and say the Sabbaths are the holy days, well, the seventh day Sabbath is equally a holy day as well, according to the Bible. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them concerning the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations. Even these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, and holy convocation shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. So, if you look back at Colossians 2, you can see that these ordinances that have gone away are to do with feasts. So people will say, yeah, it's to do with the feasts, that's why it's meat and drink, you know, and that's why the Sabbath are only talking about the feast days. But what you have to remember as well, not only is it says Sabbaths, not only is the seventh day Sabbath a holy day, just like all the other Sabbaths are holy days, but when we look in Leviticus 23, when we're given a chapter saying, hey, these are the feasts of the Lord, right? These, even these are my feasts, what's included? The seventh day Sabbath. So you see, the seventh day Sabbath was a day, you know, a feast to the Lord. It's a holy convocation, as well as the other feasts as well. So it's like there was a weekly holy day, as well as, you know, like what we would consider like public holidays, like special days, which are also recognized in the nation of Israel. Now let's go to Romans 14. Romans 14 verse 5, it says here, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. 
So to me, this is another good verse to show why in the New Testament time, right, and under the New Testament covenant, that the Sabbath no longer applies. Because if Paul believed that the Sabbath applies, how could he tell believers in Rome to say, well, one man esteems one day, you know, above another. That would be like somebody who keeps the Sabbath. But he says, but another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So it shows that this is an area of conviction where somebody can choose that one day is more important or every day is alike. And it's, it's up to the individual. It's up to the individual's conscience. Now, if it were a sin, if it was something that still applied in the New Testament, Paul could not say this. I couldn't say to somebody, hey, every day is alike if one day had to be important, if one day had to be different from all the others. Right? Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Now, this means that there isn't a specific day of the week that is holy anymore in the New Testament. It's something that was temporary for the Old Testament. Now, what I don't think this means is that working seven days a week is a wise thing to do. Because people might say, hey, well, I'm the guy that thinks every day is alike. So therefore, I can work every day. And I think that's where we're missing the greater principle of the Sabbath day in the Old Testament and why it may be in the Ten Commandments because it's something quite important that it is wise for people to have one day off. Not only for yourself because you need to, you know, at least refresh and have a day where you can refocus yourself and be refreshed physically, but also for the sake of the people that work for you as well. So you say, hey, it's wise not to work seven days a week, but, you know, would it be right to force, you know, if you had a servant, you know, not necessarily an employee, right, because employee may work it into the contract, but a servant or animals that work for you, would it be right for you to just make them slave away seven days a week? You know, so the principle there is that you ought to give people a day of rest. And in fact, you know, you, they'd probably be more productive if you let them rest, you know, re refresh and, um, and reset um, and, and to, in order to be more, a more productive worker. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of Western civilizations have found that. And which is why you know, there's a big emphasis on, you know, lifestyle, you know, balance, you know, life, what do they say? Work life balance, right? Because they find that they, they, if you give people more freedom, you give them a bit more balance, they actually become happier, more productive people. So that's what I think that this, that this principle is. And we see here in Mark 2, look at what uh, Jesus says. He says, and he said unto them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So this is also that same <laughs> scenario where Jesus heals in the synagogue, the man with the withered hand, where he reminds them again another principle that God didn't institute the Sabbath. He didn't create man in order for man to keep a Sabbath for him, right? He actually instituted the Sabbath because it was good for man and man needed that rest. And, you know, is it that he, not only did he know that man needed that day to, to refocus and refresh and everything like that, but there are a lot of other reasons, but we see here one of the main reasons why the Sabbath was made. So, you know, this means people have the liberty. This is my position on the Sabbath. And, you know, this, when it comes to convictions, these are things that people discuss. But what I think this means practically is, you know, people have the liberty to rest on other days. You know, if they wanted their rest day to be a Monday, you know, maybe their work's not conducive for, you know, having a rest on, on a certain day. Or maybe they'll try and come to church on su Sunday morning, but they'll still have to work Sunday night. You know, they work nights and there's another day that they take off. Or what about people that work multiple weeks? Let's say you work two weeks and then you take two days, you know, two days off. You have two, the equivalent of two weekends. Is that okay too? Some people do that. Two weeks on, you know, one week off. You know, I think uh, people have liberty to, to do what they want. But I would say if we follow God's wisdom, ideally, you would work six days, you know, at the most and take a day off. And that's probably the best pattern to follow. But if other people have different patterns, I'm not... I'm not, I wouldn't go so far as to say they're sinning, you know, I just say it's probably not a wise thing to do. God has given us a precedent in the Bible where we can see. Now, is Sunday the new Sabbath? So some people, I already explained in my position, my position is, you know, Sabbath is not something we do in the New Testament. So it's an area of conviction and we have a principle from the Old Testament that we can try and apply in our lives that, that has some wisdom in it. Right? And we can learn a lot of things from the Old Testament that are not necessarily sinful today, but have wisdom in it. Like when we think about the eating laws, 
and we say, well, in the Old Testament they weren't allowed to eat pork. In the New Testament we are allowed to eat pork. So we say, well, it's not a sin to eat pork, but what's the wisdom behind eating pork? It probably tells us if God considered the pig an unclean animal, it's probably wise how pigs are farmed and what they're fed, and that makes a big difference to the quality of pork, right? So if they feed them, if you just eat a wild pig, it's actually very dangerous, right? Because you don't know what that pig is eating. It's eating all sorts of stuff because they're omniv uh, omnivorous. But farm pigs are very different. They have to be very careful what they feed those pigs so that you don't get certain diseases and certain things like that. It's the same with cows as well, right? To, to a lesser extent. Now, is Sunday the new Sabbath? Now, some would try to argue, for people that do believe that Sabbath keeping is still applicable in the New Testament, but they need to justify, well, why don't we do it on Saturdays, but we do it on Sundays? They sort of think, well, what reason do we have to, to sort of change it to Sundays? So here, here is their reasoning, right? So some will try to argue that Sunday for Christians is the new day of rest. And how many of you have heard people refer to Sunday as the Lord's Day? And they'll say, like, oh, you don't do things on the Lord's Day because that's like the Sabbath for the Christians and that's why you ought not work on Sunday. I, I mean, I'm all for trying to get people to prioritize church and getting people to come to church and, and, you know, using one day to serve the Lord and things like that. But I'm not for people doing it for the wrong reasons, right? Like, I don't, not, I'm not for promoting certain practices with unsound doctrine to get people to do that. So this sermon here is not about you not prioritizing Sunday. I think we ought to try and manage our schedules so we can meet on a certain day and have a weekly meeting, which is why we meet. But I don't think what we're doing here today is we're keeping a Sabbath on a different day. Now, where do they get this phrase from, the Lord's Day? Well, it's found one time in the Bible and it's in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Now they'll say, well, God does talk about my holy day and my my sabbath day so they try and say well you know and it's it's reasonable it's not that it's unreasonable for them to say that the lord's day that john is referring to here is the, the sabbath day but even so that wouldn't justify that it's a sunday right if you're going to say the lord's day is the sabbath then wouldn't it be the saturday and therefore the lord's day would be saturday not sunday but that's where the phrase the lord's day comes from now to me it would make more sense considering the context of Revelation and what Revelation is about, that the Lord's day being referred to here, he's in the spirit on the Lord's day and he sees a vision that it's referring to the day of the Lord, right? Which is when Jesus Christ returns and that's referred to <coughs> as the day of the Lord. Look at here in 2 Peter 3. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us with, not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So we see here the day of the Lord, but later on it says here, seeing then that all these things down there shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So to me it makes more sense that the Lord's day being referred to in Revelation 1 is referring to the day of the Lord or the day of God as opposed to the, whole, the Holy Sabbath, right? The, the seventh day Sabbath. Now why do Christians meet on Sundays? You say like, well, if the Sabbath is Saturday and that's the day when we should rest and, you know, okay, well, we don't keep it today. If we're not meeting here today because it's the new Christian Sabbath, it's the New Testament Sabbath, why do we meet on Sundays? You know, why don't we meet on Monday? Why don't we meet on Tuesday? Besides the fact that it would be inconvenient because in Australia, you know, we don't, everybody works those days of the week. But let's say in another country, if let's say another country you work from, you know, Wednesday to Monday, 
and then like Tuesday was your day off. Would it be wrong for Christians to meet on Tuesday? They could meet on Tuesday. But why do we historically meet on a Sunday? <coughs> well, it's because this is the pattern <coughs> and precedent we see in the New Testament. And I'll show you all these passages. So, it's, so why do we meet on a Sunday? It's not about resting. It's not about a New Testament Sabbath. It's because when we meet here together, what are we doing? We, it is a memorial. It is a day where we remember the risen Lord Jesus. Right? And this is, this is why things are centered around the first day of the week, because it's an important day. It's the most important day in, in the Christian calendar, right? The day that Jesus rose again. We know he rose on the first day of the week. Mark 16, 9. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. So that's one reason. Jesus rose again on the first day of the week, which is why when we get together, we are um, gathering in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And because of his death and resurrection, we are able to commune here together. John 20, verse 19. Look at this. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, when the, when, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. So you see, they were gathering that same day that even. So I would say they were gathering maybe around four or five o'clock, you know, just before the next day ticked over. And Jesus appeared to them. So not only are they gathered together on the first day of the week, but we see here the first, one of the first appearances of Jesus after he had risen again from the dead. He went to that gathering and he said, Peace be unto you on the first day of the week. Now, not only this, but the same day a week later, right? It's, it's the same. And after eight days again, his disciples were with him and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Now, I know it says here after eight days, and we would think, well, if it's eight days later, wouldn't that be a Monday? But um, a lot of people believe that this after eight days is referring to eight days from the resurrection, right? So that would include the day, the first day that he appeared to them, which was the Sunday, and then eight days after his resurrection, which would have been a Sunday again, the same thing happens, right? And this is when Thomas is there this time. Because you remember doubting Thomas? Didn't believe that Jesus had risen from again from the dead? So the same time next week is what a lot of people believe, that they were gathered again together and Jesus again appears and says the exact same thing. Peace be unto you. Now, not only that, centered around the resurrection, well, we have some meetings there, but we have some other examples in the Bible as well. One is <coughs> in Acts 2. Um, I won't go to Leviticus 23 again, but in Acts 2, I'll just explain it for sake of time, but this is the day of Pentecost. Now, the day of Pentecost, if you remember, they were gathered in that upper room and the Spirit fell on them and they were given the gift of tongues and the Spirit was poured out. That day as well was also the first day of the week. Why? Because the day of Pentecost, if you remember from Leviticus 23, it was the morrow after the Sabbath. So the Sabbath was the Saturday and then from the morrow after the Sabbath, you counted seven Sabbaths and then 50 days, on the, which would be the morrow after the Sabbath. That would be a Sunday as well. That would be the first day of the week. And that was the day of Pentecost. So we see here another day when they gathered on the first day of the week. And that's the day when the Spirit was poured out on them at the day of Pentecost. Acts 20. Here are some explicit ones where we have one in Acts 20 and in 1 Corinthians 16. And when you look up you know, on the internet, when people say, hey, why are we gathering on a Sunday? You always get these two examples because they're the most explicit. Acts 20 verse 7. It says here, and upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. So we have an example here again, where the disciples are meeting on the first day of the week, and they're breaking bread together, they're eating together, like we do as well. And 1 Corinthians 16, it says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So notice here, the assumption here is that they're meeting on the first day of the week because he's giving them, or he's giving them instruction on how to take up a collection. So he's saying, hey, you ought to, every week, when you gather on the first day of the week, 
take up the collection. So it's not that just when Paul comes, there's one collection made. There, should, there ought to be a fund that is building up in order for Paul to utilize. And notice this, that it's not only for the Corinthian church. So you could say that this is a third example, because not, as he, not only is he telling the Corinthian church to do this and assume that they're meeting on the first day of the week, but also the churches of Galatia. So there are multiple churches that he, is, he has given this instruction to. So we see here this precedent in the Bible of them meeting on the first day of the week. Now this is why I don't say you must meet on the first day of the week because a biblical precedent does not equal a biblical command. right? You can be commanded to do something and that would mean it's a principle, that it would be a sin, that if you break that commandment. But if it's just something we see the apostles doing, that can give us wisdom and reason to do something but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a sin not to do it, but it's good reason to do it. So just make sure you distinguish between that. So I wouldn't go so far as to say if a church meets on a Wednesday night, you know, maybe because they can't, maybe they don't have a place to meet on a Sunday. Maybe they don't have a hall. You know, maybe the person who's running it is not available on Sundays at the beginning. You know, would that be a sin? If it was a sin, they wouldn't be allowed to do it. But if it's just wisdom, hey, they could have it on another day, but it would be best if it's on the first day of the week because of the significance. Now this is my last section, just so you know sort of where I am in my sermon. This is my last section. What does the Sabbath represent? <coughs> the Sabbath also is a <laughs> picture, <coughs> excuse me, a picture of salvation. Now how is it a picture of salvation? Well this is the explanation we get in Hebrews 4. It's a picture of salvation because it's a rest, just like salvation is we rest. So it's a, it's a good support for why salvation is not by works. Because this is what Hebrews 4 is telling us, that the Sabbath is actually used to explain why salvation is not by works. Salvation is we cease from our works and we enter into God's rest. Hebrews 4, let's just go through this quickly. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it. So it likens salvation as entering into a rest of God. And the Sabbath is used as one of those pictures. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So it's talking about the Israelites not being allowed after they came out of Egypt to go into the promised land. Why? Because they did not believe the spies that came out of the promised land telling them that God had delivered it into their hands. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So what he's referring to here now is he's saying, hey, if we are saved, we enter into a rest. Because he refers to a psalm here, if they shall enter into my rest. And he's saying, even though the world is already created. So he's saying here that this is not talking about the seventh day rest. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. So what he's telling to, the, telling to the Hebrews here is, when you keep the seventh day rest, that's not the rest that God is talking about. Like when he says, you, you enter into my rest, it's not the fact that you're keeping the seventh day Sabbath, because God had already finished all the works of the world. The seventh day Sabbath had already occurred, which was the Sabbath that God was referring to. And then in Genesis, it's saying, hey, in this occasion, this is where God refers to the seventh day Sabbath. Right? God rested for the rest of the seventh day from all his work. And in this place again, so now he's referring to the psalm, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. So what is he saying here? He says again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, today. So this psalm is saying today, if you will hearken to my voice, you know, harden not your hearts and enter into my rest. He's saying David already wrote that after they weren't allowed to enter into the promised land. So it's many years later. But yet he says today at Psalms. So he's making the case here in Hebrews that it's not talking about the seventh day. Salvation is not talking about, the rest of God is not talking about the seventh day Sabbath. It's not talking about entering into the promised land. It must be talking about something else because God already finished all his works. They already were not allowed to enter into the promised land. And yet David, after they had entered into the promised land, even after Joshua had brought them into the promised land, David still says today there will be a rest one day left for the people of God. 
So that's that picture there that this Sabbath represents, you know, this rest. It has this symbolism of salvation, which is alluded to in Hebrews 4. For he that is entered into his rest also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. So this is sort of a play on words, right? The fact that you don't have to work your way to heaven, but then what you labor for is making sure that you enter into that rest, right? Which is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Now, I'll just finish on this last point, because this is what's interesting about the Sabbath, if you haven't realized it in the past. So the Sabbath, like we talked about, is a day of rest. The Sabbath is a picture of salvation in the sense that when we enter into God's rest, we cease from our own works. You know, we repent from dead works and we trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, have you noticed in Leviticus 23, we know that every seven days on the Saturday, there is a Sabbath of rest, right? So we don't do any work therein. But notice when we go into the feast, the first feast that is mentioned is the, is the Passover. So the Passover is the 14th day of the first month at even. That's the Lord's Passover, right? So this is when Jesus was crucified because G Jesus fulfilled that Passover day where they would kill the lamb the even before the Passover day, so on the 13th day of the month was when Jesus died. So Jesus died the day prior to the Passover, right? Because he died to fulfill that timing when the Passover lamb was killed. Jesus was the Passover lamb killed. This is why they were trying to take the thieves off the cross before the Sabbath, because the Passover was coming, and the Bible tells us that Sabbath day was a high day, so it's a special type of Sabbath. But they were trying to get those guys off the cross and, you know, they came to Jesus to break his legs and they didn't break his leg because he was already dead. And they wrapped him up to prepare so that they could rest on the Sabbath day. And it even tells us about the women that they actually prepared the spices prior to going to the tomb. And it even tells us in one of the Gospels that they prepared those spices and then they rested according to the law because you had the Passover, which was the first holy day of convocation. But notice the day after the Passover, the Passover was the 14th day of the month, but the 15th day of the month was also a Sabbath. Why? Because that was the, after the Passover, you had the seven days, which was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now he specifies here, Feast of Unleavened Day, the same day of the month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. In the first day you shall have an holy convocation, you shall do no servile work therein. Now, why does he specify in the Feast of Unleavened Bread that only the first day and the last day is the Holy Convocation? Because he, he didn't want, you know, like, it's like, like Chinese New Year, right? Chinese New Year, they're two weeks, and it's just like every day, they're just like doing their monthly feasting, but you still had to work during that time. So he's saying here, only in this week of Unleavened Bread, it's only the first day and the last day is a holiday, but the other days, you know, you could work. You're not taking a whole week off. So that's why I think it's specified there in Leviticus 23. So notice, you have Jesus dying the day before the Passover. Then you have the Passover, which was a Sabbath of rest. Then you have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was also a Sabbath of rest. And then you had the Saturday, because Jesus rose again the first day of the week, you had the Saturday, which was also a day of rest. So this is what is amazing about these Sabbath days is that when Jesus died, what happened after he died? His soul descended into hell and he was paying the, the wrath of God for the sins of mankind for three days and three nights. Like Jonah was in the whale of the, in the heart of the, uh, was in the whale of the belly. So shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. But those three days, Jesus was doing all that work for us, you know, dying and paying for our sins. What was mankind doing? Resting all three days. Right? So you have three Sabbaths in a row. And I just think that's amazing. That, that picture of Jesus dying for the sins of the world while God's people rested from their works. And it's a picture of salvation. And then he rose again the first day. And because of that, this is why we, we meet on Sundays. So I hope you learned something today. I know it's a bit of a deep sermon, a lot of different topics. But hopefully it gives you a bit of an overview on the Sabbath and gives you good reason for why we do what we do. So next day, Sabbath keeper comes to you and says, 
oh, you know, the Sabbath is a Saturday, but why do you meet on Sundays? You say, well, I'm not keeping a Sabbath on Sunday. I'm just remembering the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for uh, teaching us. And I just pray, Lord, that, um, you know, a lot of information in this sermon. I just pray that some of it sticks, Lord, and pray that your spirit will work in the hearts of your people here. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us this pattern that we know not to just work ourselves to the bone, that rest and relaxation is important. And I just pray, Lord, that you help us to have that balance. Help us, Lord, to not use, uh, you know, our liberty uh, for an occasion for the flesh and use it to skip out on your house. So I pray, Lord, that everyone here would prioritize your house and, uh, Lord, that they would do their best to, to move their schedule so that we can meet here to um, remember you uh, and remember the resurrection each first day of the week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.